for the opportunity that we have to be able to be gathered here together with one another and with you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to be called your, your, your children. And, and so, Father, we just, uh, that's how we come to you as our children gathered around their, uh, around their loving Heavenly Father. And, Lord, we just uh, praise you for that opportunity. Thank you that you've promised that you hear our prayers and that you've uh, promised to be uh, faithful as it is your nature to, to do so. And we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We're thankful for the love of God that would be willing to lay down the life of his own son to sacrifice him on that cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life. Thank you for Jesus being willing to pay our debt of sin uh, uh, that we had against us and be able to take that upon himself. Thank you also for the victory that he got over death as he was able to come out of that grave uh, alive. And so, Lord, we just are grateful for that and, and uh, we relish in the eternal life that, um, that we have the hope of uh, because of what he did for us. Father, we're also thankful for the opportunity to uh, be together and to be an encouragement to one another, to lift each other up, to build into each other's lives and to strengthen one another. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to worship you through the singing of these songs. And, and um, Lord, your name is wonderful and worthy to be praised. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to, to share the gospel with, with friends and family and, and uh, others that we come in contact with. We're thankful also for um, special projects where we get to do that. I think of of Caden and the trip that he took last year and the trip that he gets to take this year. And we just pray for your hand of blessing to be upon him and, and the whole group in a mighty way that they would see young people come to Christ and others bolstered in their faith. We pray that <clears throat> some of the young people that they got to impact this year, that they would find this coming year and find doing well. I think of the apostle Paul as he traveled around from place to place and, and wrote these letters and, and um, <clears throat> the joy that he got as he, as he found people in those places doing well that he had reached the time before. And we just pray for that same kind of an experience in this coming mission trip. Father, we uh, thank you for Randy, and we just uh, pray for him and hold him up. Oh, God, as he's having this real struggle with his, with his health, God, we pray for your uh, hand of healing and blessing upon him. Uh, Lord, we pray for Donna also that you be with her through this. Bring them uh, comfort. Thank you for the fact that they know you and walk with you. And, and we just pray that uh, they would uh, experience your comfort in a, in a very fresh way, Lord. And we just we pray for the doctors and stuff uh, as well, the surgeons and that, that, that you'd give them wisdom going forward. And, and um Having not heard of the surgery that's happening happened already, I just I just pray that that went well and hope that um, healing from that would would be quick and complete. Father, we also continue to lift up. I think of Carolyn Sahid, and we just uh, pray for her. I think a I think of Bailey. I pray that you'd start strengthen her against the temptations that she she's facing. And uh, Father, I I think of I think of Craig as he continues to uh, deal with. Uh, with things from from his uh, surgery, as he had a tumor removed uh, several years ago, and uh, Father, we just uh, pray for continued uh, strength. and And he has his his good days and his bad days, and and we just pray that he'd have more and more good days, Lord. And 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 we're uh, and we're we're just very thankful for him. <clears throat> Father, we pray that as we open your Word today, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would take the the spiritual truths that are found within it and through the power of your Holy Spirit speak them into our hearts and lives. And may we leave here a little bit different than how we walked in, a little bit more closely conformed or transformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray it. Amen. Okay, let's take our Bibles out. We're going to open to the book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, we're going to cover a lengthy chunk of scripture this morning as we're going to begin in chapter 2 with verse 17, and we're going to read through that and all the way through chapter 3, which chapter 3 is not real long, it's 13 verses.
So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. It says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly, with great desire, to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we most earnestly night as we pray most earnestly, night and day, that we may see your face, see you face to face, and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. You know, this weekend, uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity to sit in the deer stand with my granddaughter, Anna Lee, as uh, as hunting season opened up and I will tell you this I don't think I have ever seen so many partridge yeah I brought the wrong gun apparently because uh, we were sitting there waiting for deer never got to see a deer all day long except for the one that my grandson Ryder shot we got to see that one as they brought it back to camp at lunch but but um, we we got to quite a show of the partridge uh, one partridge come walking across and we watched that one and then another one and then one came from this way and then one came down out of the tree and all day long these weren't all right one right after the other well some of them were and they're just coming from all directions just in and out right in front of us you know we bird hunt out there too and we never get that many birds <laughs> but you show up looking for deer and that's how it works out sometimes i guess well you know what uh if we're not careful same kind of thing can happen to us in life we find ourselves aiming for one thing when maybe we should be uh, hunting for something else and that's what I'm talking about is, you know, this passage is all about the Apostle Paul and his relationship with these people, his care and his concern. And these people were definitely a priority in his life, as this whole passage points to. And they were important to him. And you know what? Sometimes we recognize, I think, that people are important in our lives as well, right? Our families are important to us. Our, our church family is important to us. Our friends are important to us. Other people we come across, we ought to be eager to meet and to get to know as well. And people ought to be, but we, I think I also will recognize that sometimes we can tend to drift and get focused on other things. And sometimes we end up focusing on uh, work and work-related things. Not that work doesn't deserve some focus. It does, and work is actually a good thing. It's not a result of the fall or anything. It's a, it's a profitable thing for us to be engaged in. But if we're not careful, our, our thoughts and things about work can choke out other things that are maybe of more importance. Uh, we can do the same thing with, with hobbies, uh, with sports. We can do the same things with lots of different things in our life. There's no shortage of things that can come in, into play. I remember one time when I was in college, when I was in college writing to a, a pastor, in fact, it was an assignment. We had to write to a pastor and ask him some different questions. And one of the questions is, what do you find to be an obstacle to the ministry in your particular ministry? And I wrote to a pastor out in the Pacific Northwest. It was one that I was familiar with. I was originally from there. And he was in the greater Seattle area. And he wrote back to me and he said, well, he says, Greg, as you know, uh, our area has a lot of beautiful things to afford. On the, on the one side of us, we have the mountains, 
and and the things that you can do in the mountains and on the other side you have the the Puget Sound and and then if you go all the way out to the coast you have the Pacific Ocean and just north of that you have uh, the Straits of Juan de Fuca and the San Juan Islands and he says so there's just so many things for people to go see and do that uh, a lot of times trying to get them to focus on something about God or something else can be a real struggle. Well, I find that it's not just in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, we've got our beautiful lakes here and the beauty of being out in the woods. And I think every place you're at has its own kind of beauty. But the thing is, is sometimes we can get focused on some lesser important things to the expense of some greater important things. And I think that that's what this passage really teaches us, is it puts up a warning to not do that. You see, the Apostle Paul, is, as he's writing to these believers in Thessalonica, and he's been there to minister among them before, and, and he's hoping to return. He's trying to get back there, but one thing or another seems to keep delaying the trip. And, and uh, so he finally writes to them. And what we see in this passage from this part of chapter 2 up through chapter 3 is just him pouring out his heart about how he feels about these believers in Thessalonica and how important they are to him. In fact, it's it's quite a strong statement right at the end of chapter 2 and verses 19 and 20 he says this for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting the crown of boasting was the one that would kind of like in in Corinth and stuff or when with the Olympics they put a crown on the winner's head you know it's that kind of a that crown that he's talking about he says what is our crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming so he's saying whenever Christ comes back when he comes back and we stand before God what do we have that we're excited about and this is his answer is it not you for you are our glory and joy He's looking ahead to when Christ returns and he says, when, I, when, I, when we stand before Christ someday, what do we have to be all excited about? And he says, isn't it you? He says, you're what I have to be excited about. You see, he, those people were so, they were so important to him and people should be important to him. They should be important to us too. You realize that uh, of all the things in this world, of all the things on the earth, there's only two things that last forever. One's the Word of God and the other one's the souls of men. And the Apostle Paul was taking the Word of God to people and so he's dealing with those two eternal things. And so what kind of things, when you look around, what kind of things are ultimately valuable? Well, the Word of God and people because those are the two things that last. You know, I've said many times, you know, whatever you do for a living, Whatever, whatever work you accomplish. And I'm not, I'm not playing it down. I think that work is a good thing. And we're supposed to be involved in it. In fact, about six days a week we're supposed to be involved in it. It's a good thing to participate in. It's a good thing to work hard. You know what? Almost no matter where you work, when you leave, somebody else is just going to take your place. And that's good. It needs to work that way. Do you know where somebody else just can't step in and take your place? It's with your people. It's with your people. Within your, within your family. They lose you. Somebody else doesn't just step in and take your place. You is what they had. Within your friends, same thing. They're, they, they might, they're going to get other friends. But not as a replacement. They're not a replacement. You had a special spot. Amongst our church family, the same thing. Every once in a while... I spend, not, not because I intend to or plan to or set a certain day of the month or anything like that, but I find myself often stopping and thinking back to all the people that were here when I got here and all the people that have passed away since. And, and they're just some very special people to me. And you know what? I love all the people that are here more recently and that have, that have come that weren't here when I got here way back then. And I love you too. And, but, but you know what? You're not a replacement. I still have a special spot in my heart for every one of them. And there are certain things that stand out about every one of them. I was just thinking about Florence Grotberg this week. I don't know how many of you remember her. But that lady would be at like everything, could almost hear none of it. Just a very faithful. I used to joke with Florence that we had to work to keep her out of the youth group. Right, because she was like in her 80s, and and uh, but she was just such a faithful lady, and just and and but fact of the matter is she couldn't hear half of what was going on, and but but any rate, you know that's people, 
You know what, Florence, Florence hasn't been with us for many, many, over, probably 20 years or better. She hasn't been with us, but you know what? Oh, we're gonna meet her again. She's, she's eternal. She's going on. She's with the Lord. And that's, that's why people are important. The Apostle Paul knew that. And we see him emphasizing the importance of these people. He said, you are so important to me that when I think of standing before Christ, what is going to be my greatest joy to be able to put my arm around you and say, I'm glad these people are with me. They're my joy before Christ at his return. They're my crown of boasting that I was able to get to them and share the gospel with them and, and they're here now. And so the importance of people, well, that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Well, as, as the Apostle Paul communicates his importance or their importance to him down through this passage, he, he does it by using several different actions. We get to see actions that he was involved in that communicated how important these people were to him. And we need to know that because if people are important to us, then we should have similar actions. We sh there should be things in our life that people can see that, that communicate how important those people are to us. And so that's what we're going to look at as we look at this passage. Is we're going to recognize five different actions. Now, the first, actions that, the first action that shows up all through the passage is that if we really care about people, then we're going we're gonna to show up. We're going to show up. And that's what the Apostle Paul, most of this section is about this, this one point. He's saying, look, we, we, we had come, they had come to them before. They traveled to Thessalonica and they brought the gospel. They shared the gospel with them. They, they told about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins and rose again from the dead. And, and he invited them to Christ to put their faith in Christ. And they did. They did. And then they began to grow in that faith and their understanding. And in fact, if we look back at the beginning of the letter, he pointed out their faith, their hope, and their love, and, and uh, the works of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope that they had exhibited in their life. And then he had to leave. He leaves under some trying circumstances, just like at Philippi. There's a riot that happens at Philippi over the gospel. There's another riot that happens in Thessalonica over the gospel. And the Apostle Paul leaves, and then, you know what he keeps trying to do? He just keeps trying to come back. And one thing or another, he's not real specific about it. He says that Satan has gotten his way. Satan hindered him from being able to come back. So he's disrupting his plans. He doesn't tell us specifically what Satan did, and that's okay, because we don't need our focus really to be on Satan. But uh, he's recognizing that Satan's getting in the way, and we'd recognize that Satan is going to try to disrupt ministries. He doesn't want the gospel to get out to people and them to be able to put their faith in Jesus Christ and, and uh, have eternal life. He doesn't want people to grow in their faith. And so obviously he's going to be putting obstacles in the way of, of ministries that are uh, trying to be effective at that. But <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, now what is he doing? He's, he's unable to, but he's determined. He wants to, he wants to show up. Notice what it, it says in... in uh, Chapter 2 and verse 17 and 18, he says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time... Now notice all the language here all points to this one thing. He says, since we were torn away. In other words, they didn't want to leave. So we, we didn't want to leave. We were, we were torn away from you. We, we had to go. And then he says, for a short time. And he says, in person but not in heart. In other words, we're not physically there, but you know, our hearts are still with you. We're still thinking about you. We're still praying about you, for you. And so our hearts are still there. So that in shows that he still wants to be there with them. And then he says, we endeavored. In other words, they put effort after it. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. And so he says, look, we... We, wanted, we, had, we were torn away, but we're torn away physically. We're still there in, in heart. Our heart is still with you. We've tried to get back. So far, we've been unable to get back. And so, you know what the fact of the matter is? Sometimes when you care for somebody, you're not going to be able to be with them all the time. And that's what we see Paul facing here. But we still see that desire to be there. That desire to want to be with them. You may not be able to be with them, but you still have that desire to be with them even when you can't. In chapter 3 and verse 10, he also he goes on to point out, he says, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face. And so, so then not only have they tried to do it, they're continuing to petition God and, and ask God that they'd be able to get back there and see them face to face. 
And then also in verse uh, 6 of chapter 3, when all that wouldn't work, what did they do? They did the, kind of the next best thing, right? They sent Timothy. And so they sent Timothy. And he says that you always, and, and when Timothy got back, he reported to them that not only did the apostle want to see them, but they wanted to see him. It says, you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. So the apostle Paul took encouragement in their desire to see them as well. But the point of the matter is, the Thessalonian people were very important to the Apostle Paul. One of the ways that you can see that importance is because he was there, he showed up. He was there when he could be there. When he couldn't be there, he was wanting to be there. He was trying to be there. He was praying to be there. But you know what the fact of the matter is, is the things that we, the people that we want to be around, we find a way to get around them. And when things are such a way that we can't, we still want to be around them. And we pray that it would come soon, that we could be with them. And that's exactly what's happening in the Apostle Paul's life. When people are a priority, when they're important to us, being with them is one of the actions that manifest that. Well, secondly, the action of prayer. We can pray. As we just kind of alluded to that there in just, just a moment ago, we found the Apostle Paul praying about that. Um, in, uh, in chapter 2, we're going to back up a little bit in the passage that we dealt with the week before because that's actually where the Apostle Paul started praying for them. In chapter 2, verse 13, it says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so in that passage, he already acknowledged, he said, you know what, we've been, we've been praying for you and thanking God for you. And why were they thanking God? Because when they received the word of God, they received it as that. They recognized that it was the word of God. And so he says, we've been express, expressing gratitude, thanksgiving. He uh, kind of highlights the same thing again in chapter 3. In verses 9 and 10, he says, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? And so he recognized again that, you know what, as we heard back the good news about your faith in Christ, we turn right back to God again in thanksgiving. And you know, isn't it awesome the way we gain encouragement and strength from one another? You know, I remember, I remember reading in, uh, in Corinthians, it was talking about a, a, a gift. Or no, wait, maybe the particular passage I'm thinking of was in, in Philippians. As Apostle Paul is talking about receiving a gift from the Philippians, and he talked about how um, the gift that he received brought encouragement to him, and and it caused him to ex be able to extend his ministry, and so then other people would r reap the benefit of the gift that was given to Paul, and so these people, and uh, but the whole point in the end was that all the people would end up glorifying God. He said, so many people will end up praising God and glorifying God just because of this one gift that you gave. And it's the same thing that we see happening here, but not with a gift, with, with prayer. As the Apostle Paul says, you know what? I sent, I, I was hoping that you guys weren't losing faith, right? Because they're going through a lot of struggles, as he mentioned in the passage. And he says, I was worried that those afflictions, those sufferings would cause you to maybe lose your focus on Christ or to fall away from your faith. And so I was really worried about you, wanting to get back to you, but couldn't. Finally, we sent Timothy. Timothy gave us a good report that you were growing in your faith, that you were strong in your faith. And what does that news do to Paul? It causes him to go before God with thanksgiving and say, God, thank you so much that you're continuing that good work in them and they're doing well, they're growing in their faith. You see what it did for Paul? It gave Paul like new life. It gave him strength. It gave him encouragement. And that's what our lives do together. As we grow in our faith, it encourages other people in their faith. And you have people that are praying for you. That when they see God answering that prayer by you growing in your faith, it, it embolsters their, their prayer life. And it strengthens them. And that's exactly what we're seeing unfold. But not only does he talk about giving thanks to him, he says, as we pray most earnestly, night and day. He's saying we spent a lot of time we prayed for you often. During the day, we prayed for you. During the night, we prayed for you. In fact, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of like the book of Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah in the Bible, he's 
He's like writing to you, telling you what's happening, and all of a sudden he's just praying, and he's still writing it out. And the Apostle Paul does this in this letter, because he's writing to them about praying for them, and about their, their and all of a sudden he's just praying. Because notice when, in verse 11 through 13 of chapter 3, it says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. And so he's telling them, you know, we've been praying night and day. We've been praying that we'd be able to get back and see you face to face. And all of a sudden he just starts doing it. He just starts praying. May, may the Lord allow us to, to get back to you guys. And, and he just kind of bursts into prayer. You know what? One of the ways that we show people or that it is evidence that people are important to us is if we're praying for them. Bringing those people and their needs and their concerns and our relationship with them and God's relationship with them, bringing that stuff before God and just saying, God, I want like to see it work in their life about this. You know, that's, that's why we keep a, a list of things to pray about up here on Sundays. And there's another one kept on Wednesday nights. And I, different ministries, we have to have different prayer lists going around. We have text uh, pr uh, prayer chain and, and things like that. Because why? Because people, people that are important to us need help once in a while. And so we, we want to be praying about those things. And, and that's what those things are for, to be able to take care of that. Well, not only do we pray, but we also build. Now, what I'm talking about here is, uh, I did have the word grow down there. But the point, the point I'm getting at is, what, what is our desire? When, when people are important to us, we want to see them grow in their faith with God. We want to build them up. The Bible talks about us building one another up, encouraging one another, strengthening one another. And you know what? When people are important to us, we're going to be involved in their life in that kind of a way, trying to build them up in their relationship with God. If, he, if they don't know God yet, if they haven't put their faith in Jesus Christ, then we want to bring them to the point where they put their faith in Christ so they can experience the forgiveness of sins and the hope of, hope of eternal life. If they have come to that point, then we want to strengthen them in that faith and to help them grow. We want to build them up in that, in that uh, relationship with God. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul outlines with these people. Notice in chapter 3 and verse 2, he says, And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. In, in fact, in this passage, the word faith comes up five times in this passage as he talks to them about their faith. And his concern, why did the Apostle Paul want to go there? Because he wanted to build them up in their faith. Why did he send Timothy? To build them up in their faith. To find out about their faith. How are they doing in their faith? And if you look through all the different places the word faith is used in that passage, it's all those kinds of contexts. But he says, we sent Timothy, God's co-worker. That's a pretty awesome thought. When you're, when you're trying to build somebody else's life, you are partnering with God. You are his co-worker in the gospel as you strive to do that. But he sent him, why? To exhort you in your faith. In verse 10, he said, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face. Why? So that we could supply what is still lacking in your faith. Now that's, that's pretty awesome because the Apostle Paul had just recognized that they didn't know how they were doing. They were concerned. Maybe they were faltering. So they sent Timothy to find out how they were doing and to strengthen them in their faith. Timothy went and did that and he came back. And what did he say? They're doing great. They're doing great. They're, they're growing strong in, in their faith. But when the, Paul, when the Apostle Paul comes around to mentioning to them what he wants to do in their life, why he wants to see them face to face, he's like, I'm sure you can still grow a little more. So I want to be there to help. Whatever's lacking in your faith, I want to be there to help. I want to be there to help with that. And you know what? If people are important to us and God is important to us, then we're always going to want to, anybody we know to grow in their faith which means that we're going to be eager to help. We're going to be eager to be an encouragement, a participant in any way that we can. Well, we also see it in his expression of his desire in verse 8 of chapter 3. He says, for now we live if you're standing fast in the Lord. That's a strong statement. The Apostle Paul sent Timothy to find out how they're doing, found out they're doing well. The Apostle Paul says, all right, now we live. In other words, his 
quality of life would have been diminished if these people were not strong in their faith. That's how he saw it. That his qual- if these people are not strong in their faith, these people that he led to faith, that he, these people that he tried to build up in faith, people that he still wants to be there building up in faith, if their faith isn't growing, then he's going to be diminished somehow. And you know what? I don't think it's any mystery. I think it's the same thing when you have somebody that's close to you that begins to walk away from their faith or stumble in their faith. Doesn't it hurt your heart? That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's, but he's saying the positive. He's saying, now that we found out, if you are really standing firm in your faith, he says, I'm alive. I live for this. That's what he's saying. And that's why if people are important to us and God's important to us, then we live for this, helping them to grow in their faith. Now, it's pretty awesome in this passage and throughout the whole message of the book of First Thessalonians that he keeps in building them up in their faith. Remember when we looked at the very beginning of the letter, he said that they were strong in their faith, they were strong in their love, and they were strong in their hope. But then we also notice going through the whole book that he was he continues to point out that they're really strong in their faith and their love for one another, but they seem to struggle a little bit in this area of hope. And I think it's uh, because of that that he continues to point to the return of Christ. All through the book of 1 Thessalonians, it keeps coming up. He keeps focusing on it. In, uh, in this passage, in chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Notice that, at his coming. He's, he keeps bringing in that idea of Jesus coming back for us and us standing in his presence. And he says, when we stand before Christ, what's going to be our joy? Well, back in, in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he did a very similar thing. He says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And to do what? To wait for his son from heaven. As he talked about these people coming to Christ, he says, one of the things that you came Two is a looking forward to Jesus' return. And so you turned away from the idols and you turned toward Christ and now you're just waiting for His return. Anxiously. In chapter 3 and verse 13, He says, So that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of His saints. And so He says, Look, as you grow in in personal holiness and your heart is established in your relationship with God, it's all pointed to a certain time when Christ comes back. And that's exactly how we want to be when Christ comes back. We don't want to be wavering in our faith. We want to be established in our faith. And when Christ comes back, we want to, well, what is going to be our joy? May it be many other people that we've been able to influence and encourage in their faith and their walk with Christ. Well, in chapter 5 and verse 23, and maybe I should point out before you get to there, chapter 4, we're coming up very soon. When you get to chapter 4, verse 13, he's going to give some pretty detailed instruction about the return of Christ. What's, this going, to, what's it going to be like when Christ comes back? And this is because they're getting some misunderstandings about what's going to happen, and they're, they're concerned about some very practical thing. In fact, they're concerned about their people. Well, if grandma and grandpa have already died, well, what happens to them when Christ comes back? If they're not here, they didn't live long enough to make it till he got here. And those are the kind of things that they're concerned about. So he's going to spend some time teaching them about what the return of Christ is going to be like and what order things are going to happen in. But then he goes on in chapter 5 to talk about the first 11 verses of that are about the day of the Lord. And when Christ comes back for his second return and what, what that's going to be like and how we need to make sure we're not caught up Caught off guard as we head into that time. And so he spends the time talking to him about those two, those two things that are at the kind of the end of the world calendar here. And he explains those to them better so that they can have a more understanding hope of what they're looking forward to. And then he ends in chapter 5 and verse 23. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so everything that he writes to them about, about their conversion when they came to Christ, you came to wait for the return of Christ. 
as they progress in their in holiness in their relationship with god you're progressing in holiness so that you'll be right where you need to be when christ returns and there's a few things about christ's return that you don't understand now at the very end his final conclusion is that they a blessing that they'd be blameless at the return of christ and so as we build one another up, it's all pointed toward that day. Well, not only do we build, but one action that shows that we care for people is to fight. Is a fight. This isn't one, I don't mean you fight with them, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that they're important to you, although that does tend to be the people we fight with commonly, is the people that we care the most about, often for some weird reason. Maybe it's because they're the ones that we're vested in the most. But what I'm talking about is not fighting with, but fighting for. And the Apostle Paul acknowledges in this passage in two different places that he's in a battle for these people. He said in chapter 2, verses 18, he says, Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Again, we don't know what specifically he's talking about, but he's uh, obviously recognized some obstacles that came in the way of their ministry that he attributed to Satan. And he said, there's a foe here. There's an enemy here. So in other words, as he's reaching out, wanting to be a blessing to the Thessalonians, he notices that somebody is against him. And he's fighting that fight. He's fighting that battle. Well, later in the same passage, he says in, in chapter 3 and verse 5, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. And so he recognizes that Satan is involved trying to keep him from, from being able to have an effective ministry there and that he's going to be involved in their life trying to tempt them and draw them away from the stability of faith. At, it, at either rate, he recognizes that, that he's got an enemy to fight here, and he's standing up to fight that battle. You know what? When you think about it, I think about parents and their kids. Right? How many times as a parent you think, you know what? You can say what you want to about me. You can do what you want to to me. But my kid's a different story. That's a whole different thing. You know, I remember, I remember being in the emergency room with, with one of my kids, my, my daughters. For some reason, we had three boys and two girls, and the girls are the ones that break out their front teeth. I don't know why that is. But my daughter, Hannah, was the last of our girls to break out her front teeth. And, and um, she took her down to the river fishing, her and the boys. And just about the time I get all the kids out on a rock, she falls against a big boulder and knocks her front teeth out. So I got all these little kids spread out on rocks in the river, and I'm going, what do I do? Well, got them, got them all off the rocks and headed up the trail and back up the trail to the truck and, and off to the hospital. And she's got, like, just by a thread, some of her gums hanging there and stuff in her mouth. And we're like, I don't know what they're going to do with that. And, and the doctor, he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. And, <laughs> <laughs> at least he was honest. And he's like, you know, I'm just going to have to send a needle right through her gums and around it just kind of pull that loose part back up there and I'm thinking well he's the doctor must be the thing to do and my wife was there and boy she had a he had a battle with her because she's like oh no you don't you know what that's gonna hurt I don't and teeth are up in, I don't even know what's up in there you're not gonna do that Next thing you know, that doctor's on the phone calling Duluth, and Duluth gets him to describe it to him and says, you know what, mouths heal fat, just send him home, leave it alone. Make sure it stopped bleeding. And that was the thing to do. And you know, to this day, I think that poor kid, if I'd have been the only one there, they still would have sent that needle right through there and all that pain and whatever it would have done to future teeth, I don't know. But, but I'll tell you, that mama, she was right in there. And he wasn't even an enemy. He's actually a good guy. He was supposed to be helping us. But you know what? That's what when you deal with that kind of thing, when you care about somebody, when, you, when people are important to you, you're willing to step up for them, right? And if that involves a fight, sometime, then, then a fight's going to be had. But that, you see, that's what the Apostle Paul was doing here. He was, he was fighting for these people. He was battling against... Ephesians tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and, uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. The Apostle Paul was fighting that battle. I'm sure many of his prayers had to deal with whatever stumbling block Satan was putting in front of him to overcome it. Satan, many of his prayers were dealing with Satan would not be able to tempt them to pull them away from their faith and be successful at it. He was fighting that fight 
I find the same kind of thing in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is dealing with a, a man that was involved in gross sin. Satan had pretty much won that battle. But the church, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in 1 Corinthians and tells them, you know that the sin that guy's involved in, you need to hold him accountable. You need to call him to repentance. And if he doesn't repent, you need to throw him out, hoping that he will return in repentance. And that's exactly what happened. The church threw him out. They disciplined him. And it worked. Go figure. Just like God says it does. It worked. He got thrown out and he repented and he returned. And now the church is like, well, now what do we do? He did this horrible thing. Um, but now he has repented and he wants back in. What do we do? And the Apostle Paul writes to him and he says, welcome him. Hug him. Bring him back in. That's what the whole reason you threw him out was to hopefully bring him back. And in the midst of that, he tells him this. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, uh, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. You see what the Apostle Paul was saying? He's saying, look, if you leave him on the outside after he's repented, then he's just an easy target for Satan, and we are not unaware of the things that he's going to do to try to drag that guy down. He said... Forgive that person, embrace that person, welcome him back in. Why? Because we know what Satan's up to. You see, there's a, there's a spiritual battle, there's a fight in everybody's life. And we need to be engaged in the fight for other people's lives. Being praying for one another, sharing scripture with one another, being that encouragement. Many different ways to fight that battle, but we need to fight. And then lastly, the last action that we see is sacrifice. The Apostle Paul is willing to sacrifice. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind in Athens alone. Now, this is, this is obviously, it doesn't seem like that big a deal at first. The Apostle Paul is saying, you know what, we wanted to come to you, we couldn't come to you, so we sent Timothy so that we could find out from Timothy. Kind of not the best, but second best, it'll work. But the Apostle Paul is having a struggle with this. He really wants to be there and see those guys and to be able to supply what's lacking in their faith, to be able to be there for them. How many times, kind of same thing, parent as a child, when your children are going through a hardship, a struggle, you want to be there, you want to be whatever help you can be. It seems like that's the kind of experience that, that Paul's having. Because when he says, all right, finally, when we could bear it no longer, in other words, we're not getting there, nothing's helping us get there, we're not going to make it, we got to know how you're doing. We just can't be left in the dark like this. We sent Timothy. And the language that he uses, we were willing. In other words, not what we wanted, but we were willing to be left behind. Left behind was a term that was most often used to describe when a family member passed away. When a family member passed away and the rest of us are left behind. That gives us a little indication of how Paul is feeling here. He wants so bad to be there, to be that strength and encouragement. He's worried about them, that the struggles that they're going through, even though he'd warned them that those struggles are going to come, those struggles are going to be there, he's so worried that those struggles, that their faith is not going to be enough to hold up to it, that he wants to be there to be that encouragement. But you know what? For one reason or another, he just can't be. And so he says, all right, you know what? I'm willing to do it a different way. It doesn't have to be my way. And you know what? That's what people do that care for one another. They're willing to do it another way. It doesn't always have to be your way. We're willing to make sacrifices. When people are important to us, we're willing to sacrifice other things that are also important to us to be able to provide whatever it is they need at that time given moment so as we look at this passage here what is it at first it just looks like the apostle paul sharing a little bit about his with them about his relationship with them and it very much is that but you know what it also is a a good guideline for us because within his positive example of placing people at a high value looking at people is very important we get to see that if people are important to us, those same kind of things will be characteristic in our life. 
if people are important to us, and obviously we're going to show up. We're going we're to be there for them when they need us and be around them when we have opportunity. We're going to be praying. We're going to be praying for them as different things that are going on in their lives. We're going to be using opportunities and looking for opportunities to be able to build one another up through encouragement and strength and the sharing of God's word and, and prayer, as we already mentioned. We're going to be willing to fight that fight when they're going through struggles. We're not going to let go of that. We're going to stand in and, and fight, fight with them, fight for them. And we'll also be willing to sacrifice. That the things, you know what, that it might come along as an interruption to a day that you had planned out to do something else. But you had to set aside your plans to be able to be there for somebody that needed you. Some, some other thing interferes, and, but you were able to set aside your ways, your plans, your ideas, in order to be a benefit to those. And why do we do it? Because it's worth it. Because of all the things in the world, the only two things that last forever are the word of God and the souls of men. And we have the privilege of being involved with both. Our Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for all of the many things in this life, whether they be experiences, people, possessions, lots of different things in this life that you bless us with. Father, thank you especially for the people in our lives. And we just pray that you would help us to have the same mindset that the Apostle Paul had. That we would find one another more important than ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Okay, at this time we're going to have uh, Lord's Supper. Dell and Tom, you want to come and help me serve it, please? <laughs>